The following monologue is something that I wrote, delivered, and recorded at the Hill. It was then censored, and I was then canceled and fired. Representative Rashida Tlaib has been condemned by some over comments she made about Israel. Here's CNN's Jake Tapper reporting on what the Michigan Democrat said and the response it prompted. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan facing criticism today from what several of her Jewish colleagues have deemed anti-Semitic comments. Here's what Tlaib, the first Palestinian American woman to serve in Congress, said at a virtual event yesterday. I want you all to know that among progressives, it has become clear that you cannot claim to hold progressive values, yet back Israel's apartheid government, and we will continue to push back and not accept this idea that you are progressive, progressive except for Palestine any longer. The CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, slammed the comments saying that Israel does not have an apartheid government and said that she should not be imposing a, quote, litmus test in a tweet saying, quote, Tlaib tells American Jews that they need to pass an anti-Zionist litmus test to participate in progressive space. Some of Tlaib's Jewish colleagues in Congress agreed. Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz called her comments, quote, outrageous and, quote, nothing short of anti-Semitic. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is right. It is outrageous. It's outrageous that Rashida Tlaib is getting attacked. Tlaib is merely stating that Israel is an apartheid state and that people who claim to have progressive values cannot support an apartheid state. No matter how loose a definition of progressive we use, it certainly excludes supporting a racist apartheid system. What's outrageous is attacking Tlaib for pointing out that progressive except for Palestine is an intrinsically contradictory position. What's also outrageous is that the Anti-Defamation League's Jonathan Greenblatt would claim that Israel is not an apartheid government. What's outrageous is that Jake Tapper would accept Greenblatt's judgment as the truth and not propaganda that needed to be pushed back against. I understand that Greenblatt and perhaps Tapper feel like Israel is not an apartheid state, but unfortunately for them, apartheid isn't about your feelings. It's about facts. In 1973, the UN defined the crime of apartheid as any inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. In 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court defined apartheid as inhuman acts of a character that are committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. These inhuman acts include, among others, infliction upon the members of a racial group or groups of serious bodily or mental harm by the infringement of their freedom or dignity or by subjecting them to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, by arbitrary arrest and illegal imprisonment of the members of a racial group or groups, any legislative measures and other measures calculated to prevent a racial group or groups from participation in the political, social, economic, and cultural life of the country, and the deliberate creation of conditions preventing the full development of such a group or groups. In particular, by denying to members of a racial group or groups basic human rights and freedoms, including the right to leave and to return to their country, the right to a nationality, the right to freedom of movement and residence, the right to freedom of opinion and expression, and the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. I'd encourage Jake Tapper to look this up sometime. Here are just a few examples of Israel's apartheid policies. The law of return of 1950 allows any Jew, which means anyone with one Jewish grandparent, the right to return to Israel, the right to move to Israel and automatically become citizens of Israel. It gives their spouses that right too, even if they're not Jewish, though if they're Palestinian, that's another issue entirely. Palestinians, of course, lack that right. The Israeli Citizenship Law of 1952 deprived Palestinian refugees and their descendants of legal status, the right to return, and all other rights in their homeland. It also defined Palestinians present in Israel as Israeli citizens without a nationality and group rights. These laws together obviously fit into the International Criminal Court's apartheid criteria. More recently, the nation-state law established that the fulfillment of the right of national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. It demoted Arabic from an official language to a language with special status. It also stipulated the state views Jewish settlement as a national value and will labor to encourage and promote its establishment and development. These are just some of the reasons that human rights organizations have declared Israel an apartheid state. Al-Haq, Al-Mezin Center for Human Rights, Adala, 
The Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, ADEMIR, Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International have all documented Israeli apartheid policies. Israel's own human rights organization, B'Tselem, has declared, the Israeli regime enacts an apartheid regime. B'Tselem divides the way Israeli apartheid works into four areas. Land. Israel works to Judaize the entire area, treating land as a resource chiefly meant to benefit the Jewish population. Since 1948, Israel has taken over 90% of the land within the Green Line and built hundreds of communities for the Jewish population. Citizenship. Jews living anywhere in the world, their children and grandchildren and their spouses are entitled to Israeli citizenship. In contrast, Palestinians cannot immigrate to Israeli-controlled areas even if they, their parents, or their grandparents were born and lived there. Israel makes it difficult for Palestinians who live in one of the units it controls to obtain status in another and has enacted legislation that prohibits granting Palestinians who marry Israelis status within the Green Line. Freedom of movement. Israeli citizens enjoy freedom of movement in the entire area controlled by Israel and may enter and leave the country freely. Palestinian subjects, on the other hand, require a special Israeli-issued permit to travel between the units and sometimes inside them, and exit abroad also requires Israeli approval. Political participation. Palestinian citizens of Israel may vote and run for office, but leading politicians consistently undermine the legitimacy of Palestinian political representatives. The roughly 5 million Palestinians who live in the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem, cannot participate in the political system that governs their lives and determines their future. I was born in New York City. My great-grandparents and the family before them were from Eastern Europe. I could move to Israel today, buy a house, get a job, travel around with no problem. So could Jake Tapper and Jonathan Greenblatt. But a Palestinian like Rashida Tlaib can't even visit her family home in what is now Israel. This demographic tension is recognized by Israeli officials and politicians who have described their own country as an apartheid state. Former Attorney General Michael Ben Yair wrote in 2002, we established an apartheid regime in the occupied territories immediately following their capture. That oppressive regime exists to this day. Zahava Galon, former chair of Israel's Meretz party said in 2006, Israel was relegated to the level of an apartheid state. In 2007, Israel's former education minister, Shulamit Aloni, wrote, The state of Israel practices its own quite violent form of apartheid with the native Palestinian population. In 2008, former environment minister Yossi Sarid said, What acts like apartheid is run like apartheid and harasses like apartheid is not a duck, it is apartheid. In 2015, former Mossad chief Meir Dagan said, President Benjamin Netanyahu's policies are leading to either a binational state or an apartheid state. Even Israel's prime ministers have used the A-word. In a recently published 1976 interview, assassinated Israeli prime minister Yitzhak Rabin said, If we don't want to get to apartheid, I don't think it's possible to contain over the long term a million and a half more Arabs inside a Jewish state. In 2007, yet another prime minister, Ehud Olmert, warned, if the day comes when the two-state solution collapses and we face a South African-style struggle for equal voting rights, then as soon as that happens, the state of Israel is finished. Prime Minister Ehud Barak said in 2010, as long as in this territory west of the Jordan River, there is only one political entity called Israel, it is going to be either non-Jewish or non-democratic. If this block of millions of Palestinians cannot vote, that will be an apartheid state. But there is no other standard more universally respected in defining apartheid, not the UN, not the international criminal courts, not human rights organizations, not Israeli prime ministers, than the people of South Africa who lived under the system of apartheid. After all, apartheid is an Afrikaans word. It means apartness. It was the official policy in South Africa from 1948 to 1994, allowing white South Africans in the minority to rule over and discriminate against the vast majority of black South Africans. The definitions from the United Nations and the International Criminal Court come out of their experiences. In 1997, Nelson Mandela said, the UN took a strong stand against apartheid and over the years an international consensus was built, which helped to bring an end to this iniquitous system. But we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians.
In 2013, Desmond Tutu recalled being struck by the similarities between what he experienced in apartheid South Africa and what he observed in Israel. I have visited the occupied Palestinian territories and have witnessed the humiliation of Palestinians at Israeli military checkpoints, the inhumanity that won't let ambulances reach the injured, farmers tend their land, or children attend school. This treatment is familiar to me and the many black South Africans who were corralled and harassed by the security forces of the apartheid government. Listen to South Africa's Minister for International Relations, Naledi Pandor, addressing the United States General Assembly just last week. While we work to address contemporary conflicts, we should not ignore long-standing conflicts, such as that of the people of Palestine, which has been on the United Nations agenda throughout the seven decades of existence of this organization. We cannot ignore the words of the former Israeli negotiator at the Oslo talks, Daniel Levy, who addressed the UN Security Council recently and referred to the increasingly weighty body of scholarly, legal, and public opinion that has designated Israel to be perpetrating apartheid in the territories under its control. To my fellow Jews, to my friends in the Democratic Party who want to support Israel and think of themselves as progressive, it is important to look at what Israeli law today does, what the lived experiences of Palestinians today means as defined under international law, and what our friends from South Africa have long pointed out. But we should not stop there. South Africans didn't just define apartheid, they dismantled it. Instead of attacking Rashida Tlaib for her candor, her critics should ask themselves how Israeli apartheid could be dismantled. What would a post-apartheid country look like? Lashana Tova.